Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. She is uh, kind of a hero of mine. I have followed her career during my time in journalism school and my move out here to Saskatchewan, Alberta. Uh, she is the current senator for Saskatchewan in the Senate, Pamela Wallen. Senator, thank you so much for doing this. This is an Great. honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, it's uh, it's great to be here. I mean, we're I'm I'm enjoying life here at at Fishing Lake, and the sun is out, and it's just one of those days. And I know I'm going to have to go back to school really soon. Uh, in fact, we're starting to do all those meetings, so you know, work is in the forefront of my mind, but it's tempered by the beautiful scene that I have here. So. Well, I, I'm glad that I caught you on a good day where you've got the beautiful scenery in front of you. Yeah. Um, I have had politicians from all levels of government, from school board all the way up to senators on the show. And I start my questioning off the exact same way for every single one of them. You're no exception. Okay. Senator, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? My mother and father. Um, they uh, were incredible. I think everybody believes that about their parents, but honestly, uh, I, I just was very lucky in the in the big parent lottery in the sky. I uh, I won. My mother was a teacher in a small community. That means you do everything. Uh, half your work is on the side and off hours. And my father uh, was the X-ray technician at the hospital. He too worked. 24 seven, uh, 365 days a year. So I started with a, uh, a very good set of role models about a work ethic about your, you know, if you're lucky enough to have food on your plate and clothes to wear, then you have a responsibility to give back. The lectures were never that pointed, I witnessed it. And, and their motto in life was, you know, you can be the smartest person in the room, but if you're not kind, if you're not generous, if you're not empathetic, if you can't respond with your heart, only your head, then all the brains in the world are worth nothing. So um, they're, they taught me everything I needed to know. And while your duty to serve didn't come until later on in your life, your your first yeah. duty came in journalism. And that's yeah. where my introduction for with you came about, because I was a, a kid in a university and college and I was <laughs> looking for idols. And you were one of my journalism, uh, journalistic Whoa. idols who I, I looked up to when your interview styles. Talk to me about how you got your start in journalism from a girl in northwest <laughs> or northeast Saskatchewan, be becoming a major influencer in all of journalism across this country. Well, you know, I really did believe, and I think that was partly the old days of journalism. Not everybody went to journalism school. They didn't really even, they weren't largely invented in Canada then. <laughs> Um, but I always did believe that the work was mission, that you did have a, a duty to serve through your duty to inform so that people could make smarter decisions. So it, it to me, it's all on a continuum, right, of, of uh, how you serve and what you do. I, I'm one of those um, crazy stories about journalism. So I grew up in this small town, as you say, in Saskatchewan, Wadena, decided I was going to be a French teacher, had never heard a word of French spoken anywhere ever in my life. But, you know, found a book and down at my uncle's farm and it was in this other language and I was so intrigued. Anyway, went off to, kept that notion, went to university, took my first year of university in French um, and went to France that summer to study. And, you know, uh, that was my plan. Came back, switched into um, psychology and political science because things were happening in the world. We started a women's center on campus and it was that time of um, women finding their, their feet and, and, and carried on. And my first job was at, uh, as a social worker at the Prince Albert Maximum Security Penitentiary, wow. uh, where, where the warden of the, of the, um, of the penitentiary said, you are a hostage incident waiting to happen. 
And I, and I have, must say, having worked in newsrooms and politics and um, in the diplomatic corps, all of those things, I have never been treated as respectfully as I was in the Prince Albert Penitentiary. So, so um, you know, and I think that's, it was an interesting lesson in human nature and people. And if you show respect and treat others with respect, they'll treat you that way too. And um, then a, a friend from university phoned me said, the host of his open line show, a CBC open line radio noon show had just been rushed to the hospital. Could I get a couple of days off and come down and fill in? Cause I'd done public speaking at university and whatnot. Um, and I asked my boss, he said, sure. And I walked into that building and went, oh my God, I didn't know this was a possibility. I was one of two editorial women in the entire building. They wouldn't even let us have keys because we were girls, we were women. Uh, but despite all of those things, I just knew I'd found my place. And what was it about the, because you kept coming back, right? The, the, you found your place about the editorial part of journalism and yeah. telling stories. What was it about telling stories for me? And this is, again, this is, I know it's a bit of the show about you, but I want to just throw my two cents in here. <laughs> For me, this this show started because we don't talk anymore. We don't have conversations. We we like to throw Twitter out. Exactly. So this show completely started when I saw the rise of social media. And I said, I'm not doing it. I want to yeah. sit down and have a conversation with people because we lost that somewhere along the way. Yeah. And I don't know where it what went. For you, what was that moment when you went, this is for me? And why did it continue coming back for you? Because for me, it's just the rise of Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, I, I was way before that. I was way before computers and cell phones. Um, so it, it was still an important form of communication. And I, and I loved radio for it because that's where I started. And I did radio and then newspapers and television and now podcasts, doing my own podcast, <laughs> all of that. Um, Which we'll talk about later. <laughs> we we'll get to later. But I just felt that, you know, the social work for me was kind of the one-on-one. -on -one. You could go and help somebody, mentor somebody, listen to somebody, uh, get them from point A to point B. Um, and especially when you're young, you have the audacity, you know, that you really <laughs> can change the world um, one person at a time. And, and what radio and then subsequent forms really appeal to me is that you could talk to so many at the same time. You could engage in not just this one-on-one -on -one conversation, but a conversation with everybody that's watching and listening. So that was really appealing, not in the ego sense of look at me. It was actually the other way, the message sense, which is, do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know about that? Have you heard this? Because that will make you uh, a smarter voter. You will make smarter decisions about being a citizen. You will, you know, um, have context for the world you're living in because I know you're all busy going to work and raising kids and you don't have time to consume it all. It's my job to consume it and distill it and share it if I can. So that was just a really appealing and it's still appealing uh, to me. I, I think the everything I've done in my life has that consistent theme, that underlying uh, motivation, which is let's all take the world we live in more seriously, make sure we understand what's going on, make sure we're aware when stuff starts to veer over here or veer over there, um, that we don't let it happen and then say, oh, too bad, so sad, I guess it's too late. Like mm -hmm. we need to be participants in our world. And so I just want to be part of that process and help others be part of that process. Do you think we've lost that? In 2022, as we were recording this, most people say they don't trust journalists because yeah. they have a slant one way or the other. Yeah. You, you've been, you were in the industry for some time, and you saw the rise of the the misinformation that's been going on in the last yeah. few years. Why do you I think, think? Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I, I do think a journal, I do think a lot of people uh, feel that way and feel they can't trust journalism, and they're not wrong. Um, it's, it's become a very, very competitive 
um, business. And so whether you're working at a mainstream television network or a newspaper, or you've got a podcast, you're still uh, now competing with the Twitters and the TikToks of the world. And so you're looking for the sound bite and not the full on conversation, just that the clickbait, the sound bite, call it what you will. And that has forced people into a world where they're not providing context. And that's the fundamental job of journalism. Anybody can look at a series of facts. All they have to do is go on their phone and open up their news feed and they'll they'll see 52 headlines about everything from, you know, uh, the war in Ukraine to what movie star just got divorced, right? What you need is to have that information in some context. Otherwise, it's just a series of facts. And that doesn't happen. Uh, much anymore in the world of journalism. We've even seen that happen with newspapers, stories are shorter and all the rest. So, and then, you know, I mean, because we are so impacted by the U.S., I mean, you see what happens stateside. They've got Fox News over here and they've got MSNBC over here. And, and they're, you know, they're two different worlds. I was watching the other night uh on some political event and i went back and forth like this because i'm still a junkie and um and and it was too like i could have been on you know mars and venus or whatever the they they see the world very differently and then i was watching the other day after liz cheney was defeated uh in her primary in wyoming and and you've got one network saying, look, she didn't even live there. Um, you know, people had reason not to like her. They support Trump. She leads January 6th. They went through a series of facts. You had the other uh, network saying democracy is dead because Liz Cheney was defeated because, well, either you believe in the democratic system or you don't. And it can't just be something that you like when your team wins or the person you like wins, it has to work. On, and, and that's the kind of thing we've lost sight of. It has nothing to do with Donald Trump or whether Liz Cheney is a good person and, or not. It has to do with the world we live in and, and the rules have to be rules for me and rules for thee, but remember rules for me too. Yeah. When do you think that changed? Because I've been trying to figure this out. I've asked many journalists, former journalists, politicians, when did we change the idea that the rule of the rule for me is the same for the rule of you and vice versa? Because yeah. I, I've been trying to figure that out. And I know we're, this is completely off the topic of where how you got your start in <laughs> journalism, but that's the great thing about this show. We, we, we just have an honest to goodness conversation and people tune in. When do you think people stop stop being about the full facts and the idea of what we're hearing and what we're seeing is right instead of this left versus right up versus down like red versus blue mentality yeah. that we currently have right now well i mean i'm going to date myself horribly here but i'm going to go back to watergate because uh, while it was a seminal moment for investigative journalism and put journalism on the map, it also created celebrity journalism uh, oh, wow. okay. to the point that movies were made about Woodward and Bernstein. And then journalism schools developed and then people wanted to be famous. Journalists wanted to be famous and they wanted to be on TV. Um, so you have those um, underlying you know, uh, factors at play. And then you layer on politicians understanding that as long as they know your name, whether it's good or bad, you too will be famous and you will get reelected because people will know. And then technology came in. And as we've talked about, um, you know, the predominance of television over the years and now, uh, now the social media world. And that's what it's all about. And so it really, I mean, I'm condensing something that could be written in, in books for, uh, you know, you'd have a 47 volume set of books on this because it's a very, it's a nuanced set of changes. But when people, when advertisers started to really understand the power of, uh, 
of advertising, of using mass audiences on television and newspapers to sell their products in a very, very um, sophisticated way, then the world, you know, we think those of us who work in journalism or did work in journalism, that it's about the journalism. What we're actually doing is providing audiences for advertisers and and some, you know, we need that reality check every once in a while to say you think you're on a mission to save the world, but you know, really, this is what your work is. So you've got to do what you need to do for your own sake and try your best to keep it true and honest and contextualized and real. And because you're going to live in that other world, whether you like it or not. What do you classify as journalism? Because that's the big thing that I've been trying to fight with right now is like, yeah. don't get me wrong. I, I try to say that I'm like, I'm a re, I'm a anchor. I'm a host of this show, but I know I'm not a journalist. I'm a host of a show who brings on guests who come yeah. on and talk about certain issues and just have a conversation. But the rise of independent little tiny market uh, journalism where they have their slant, they know their slant, they know their yeah. audience. Do you consider that journalism or do you consider that more of a punditry editorialization of news? Well, well, I think it's both. I mean, I think that we have um, lost the line between uh, journalism and opinion, between fact and opinion, uh, because people are more celebrity, right? They're, they're, they're invited on to a show to talk about what they know and the story they reported on. And then they get their, you get, you ask them their views on a on a series of things, what you're doing now, what I do on my podcast, what I did for a million years when I was uh, uh, on television, even in newspapers. So, you, you know, it, it's all part of it. But I think what's fundamentally changed is that, that you know, that you're now, everybody is their own uh, national newscast. Everybody is their own newspaper because we don't watch in the same way. So we all have our ways of filtering through the information. You know, everybody used to watch the news at 11 o'clock and there'd be a kicker story, which is the funny one to, you know, leave you with something a little light, bright and trite. And then everybody went to the office the next day and went, aha, wasn't that funny? <laughs> and it gave people a good feeling. And it was kind of a national connectedness because we'd all seen that. But now we all watch it in our own way at our own time, or we don't watch it at all, or we have different sources. And so all the, the work of the journalists and the particularly the editorial function, like in a newscast to pick the 10 things that the, that group of you know, well-informed people has decided is worth sharing, that's going out the window. You know, So I am going to read what interests me. Maybe I only care about the Royals. Maybe I only care about sports, um, you know, and because it's so overwhelming and confusing, people tend to go down into the rabbit holes. I get that totally. I'm not even saying that pejoratively. I'm just saying there are only 24 hours in the day. Yeah. And with, you know, war in Ukraine and everything under the sun being declared an existential crisis, at a certain point, you just go, whoa, I think I'm going to go to my kids' hockey game and then, um, you know, watch the Rough Riders. <laughs> Just try and kind of simplify it. So that's, you know, we're in a very, very different world right now and and people are going to make their own choices. It do does you, mean you end up in an echo chamber. Do you think you'd be like... Take yourself when you first started journalism, when you first walked into that CBC yeah. newsroom to do that show. Do you think you could do what you did then now in today's no. market? No, I don't think so. Um, be, I mean, I was very lucky. I was, I've got to say, this was a time when jobs were plentiful. Now, was journalism a male business? Absolutely. Lots of uh, guys came home from the war and got into broadcasting and, and all of that. And it was uh, still very, very male. But I feel that I was able to use that to my advantage because people were starting to say, look, I mean, when I went to do Canada AM, you know, most of your viewers are female. So you can't just listen to two guys talking about, you know, whatever interests them in sports, you people need to see themselves on the screen, which is what 
we're constantly working at is as populations change and demographics change, people want to see themselves there. So, I mean, we, we were making it up. We were inventing, you know, our version of journalism at the time. Now, you know, I don't think we work 20, you know, easily 20 hour days, like all of the time. Um, that's probably now against the law. And, and also, um, you know, and we're seeing this particularly in COVID, people looking for much more work-life balance. I had zero balance in my life. Uh, work was my social group. Work was my extended family. Work was my fun. Work was my satisfaction. And so I would have never complained about that. But we did all sorts of things because we were experimenting. And I, I don't think, I mean, people would now be putting me in front of, uh, you know, groups of, they'd be, they'd be figuring out what my Q rating is and, you know, whether I'm too old or too young or too fat or too, you know, whatever it is. And, and I probably wouldn't have made it because, um, you, you know, you Go ahead. Sorry. No, I just, it was a very different time. We, they were looking for people who were just going to work their butt off for not too much money. <laughs> you talk about the news industry being a male dominated industry, yeah. which in some sense it still is. Uh, and I know, uh, and I say that with respect, but I'm about yeah. to say something that, that just happened recently in the news uh, um, earlier this month, because as of recording this and airing this yeah, at yeah. two different times, um, CTV let go uh, their chief anchor, Lisa LaFemme, yeah. and uh, put in a male to fill her position. Now, uh, but a person of color, person of color as well. Okay. Um, many people have made a lot of things out of this. We don't know the full story. We don't know yeah. both sides. Lisa has come out with her story. But do you think that the newsroom is still a sexist uh, male dominated industry? Or do you think this is just Bell TV doing what they have the right to do because it's their privately owned corporation and they yeah. have the right to fire anyone as they wish? I, I as uh, as with you, I do not all know all the details. I am not in that business anymore. There's a time where I would have been talking to 50 <laughs> people and I would have got, you know, 15 inside stories and all of this. Um, it, it's about timing, you know, like Lloyd Robertson stayed on well into his 70s. And that was um, that was you know, he was revered and he was rewarded for longevity. Uh, Peter as well, Mansbridge at CBC, the same, same sort of thing. But we're in a different time now. Um, you know, we watched what CBC did after Peter left. They went to four hosts and, you know, it was so confusing. And and uh, CTV went to Lisa, who was a, you know, a working journalist. And, he, you know, I, I just, I look at this and I go, even in my, when I ran my own uh, company uh, and did Pamela Wallen Live, I mean, everybody that worked for me by and large were women, certainly on the editorial staff. And I didn't, that wasn't some political statement about I'm only gonna hire women. I hired women because they worked hard and they were detail oriented and all of that stuff. So I don't think the, 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 you know, the sexism is still there, although we heard stories about whether or not letting her hair go gray was an issue. I think this is a story about about corporate Canada thinking they've got a handle on this, that they're going to go from a woman to Omar Sachedina and he's, you know, a, a immigrant and a Muslim, and this is a great and wonderful story. And they should have been able to do this as a good news story, as a transition between generations, as a friendly handover to, from colleague to colleague. They just blew it. Yeah. They blew they, it. They don't understand about that basic thing that we talked about at the beginning, which is you've got to show respect to people. They want their audience is sitting out there saying, who are these people that they would treat both? Omar and Lisa like this. Who who are they? That's bad business. I'm their customer and I don't like the way they behave. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's, 
it's bad business. I, again, I don't know the details and, and so I shouldn't be so clear cut, but, but it, it was a really uh, dumb way to handle this. I, we could talk about journalism for the rest of the show if we wanted, but I want to talk about your Senate career because yeah. this is one of the reasons why I had you on because um, in, I just want to make sure in 2009, you got the call. You got the call yeah. that a lot of people probably want the call, but don't ever get the call. Did you ever want to be a Senator? Was that ever something in your wheelhouse where you said, you know what, I can go sit in the red chamber for a few years and ride off my retirement until I'm 75 and then just enjoy it? Or was this something out of the blue for you? Well, a little bit of both. I mean, I had, um, when I did Canada AM, we had a political panel every Thursday morning, sort of the original political panel, uh, Kirby, Kaplan and Siegel. Now, Hugh Siegel and Michael Kirby are probably two of the most, Jerry's not in the Senate because the NDP doesn't believe in the Senate, but um, these two guys were serious intellects. Yes, they were partisans. Yes, they worked in a partisan way out of the Senate, but they also contributed this country in a major way. So covering politics and knowing some of the people in the Senate, I never shared the disparaging view of the Senate, that they're just a bunch of old guys sitting around in back rooms, you know, um, waiting out their time. The senators I knew were active, and, and I also understood the role. Sober second thought means something. The guys in the House of Commons, by guys, I mean people, the men and women um, in the House of Commons are there representing, they've got their team t-shirts on, right? And it's their job to get reelected and they don't always have the time to sit around and say, okay, is this the most precise piece of legislation we've ever written in the world if we anticipated every possible thing? So they pass bills and then they send it to us because we don't have to get elected. And we're not out there, uh, you know, trying to please everybody all of the time. And, and we get to impose that, that judgment on a bill and take a look at it and say, yeah, but you didn't think about this and you didn't think about that. That work was always, that, that always kind of appealed to me. So once I left journalism and it was Prime Minister Christian that asked me to go to New York as the Consul General after 9-11, which was a a life-changing experience uh, to be, uh, you know, running sort of toward the fire as opposed to away from it. Like it was a, and it was a really important time for both of our countries to keep communicating and talking. Uh, and then when I came back, um, it was then Prime Minister Harper who asked me to sit as part of a group of five people to figure out what was going on in Afghanistan and with our troops and what equipment we needed and all of that stuff. So, and we spent the better part of a year doing that and writing a report, you know, saying we've got to arm our people. They're getting shot up on the roads because we don't have the right equipment. Um, so it, it seemed a natural thing to find a venue. And that's kind of what, what Prime Minister Harper said, which is you've been in New York and you understand our biggest, most important relationship. And you've also just done this report on Afghanistan and, you know, you seem like the right person. So lots of people suggested it and, and I was very um, open to it. And, but you're still surprised. You're still shocked when somebody phones, uh, when the prime minister phones and asks, you're still shocked. And it's a, it's a great feeling. You've mentioned so many things that I want to dive into a lot deeper <laughs> here, and no, which is great because I, I love I love guests like yourself who bring such a wealth of knowledge and are able to articulate something that not a lot of people have been able to articulate on the show. But I want to ask this question because you, I've, I've interviewed uh, Senator Doug Black, former colleague of mm -hmm. yours. I've interviewed yep. Mike, uh, Senator Mike Duffy, a former colleague of right. yours, and I've asked them the same question, and you're going to be no exception to this. You are one of a handful of Canadians who have ever been able to walk on the Senate floor as a senator. But talk me through that very first moment walking into that chamber as a sitting member of the Senate, because there is probably an overwhelming experience when you walk onto that floor, because you are now that sober second thought 
that so many Canadians don't know happens, but yep. you know, I know happens on a regular basis. What was that moment like for yourself walking into that Senate chamber for the first time? Well, it, it was, it was um, uh, an interesting story because yes, I do take this very, very seriously. And I think that when you understand politics, it gives you a real leg up when you go into the Senate. Of course, there were there was government and opposition in the Senate, um, but those numbers change depending on who <laughs> gets to uh, to a point. And and look, in in the end, my experience wasn't you know all wonderful inside the Senate. But the funny thing that happens is that you come with this oh my God, there is so much responsibility on my shoulders. Uh, I can't believe this. Like I am not ready and I've spent a lifetime um, getting ready, right? For all of these, uh, these things. And then you walk into the caucus room and uh, the conservative caucus was pretty small at that point. And everybody was tired because if your numbers are small, it means you have to sit on six committees and then you have to do chamber duty and you're working, you know, 24 seven and everybody's tired. And the caucus chair just said, look, we're exhausted. You guys are new, you know, figure out where the bathrooms are yourself. We just need you to go to the next 10 committees and, and don't bitch and complain because you've just been appointed to the Senate. So <laughs> on the one hand, there's this grandiose, you know, you're walking into the red chamber and it's, this huge sense of pride and responsibility that comes with it. And then the next moment you're saying, okay, this is, you know, we got work to do. We're tired. You do double duty for a while. We'll call you when we're ready to, uh, to take some of the load off. So it was a good reality check. Um, and, and both things are true. It's hard work and it's hard slogging. And it's also a wonderful, incredible honor and a huge responsibility. Was there a particular interest or a particular issue that you wanted to accomplish? Because when you get appointed to the Senate, because most people might not know this, senators can still introduce bills and yep. they can still pass bills. And that's a weird concept for a lot of people yep. because you think it's just sober second thought. No, they're still a functioning part of our democracy. It's just usually we don't hear about them because right. we're always hearing about the team A and team B in the House of Commons. Right. Was there a particular issue or a particular thing that you wanted to accomplish while you, when you first got the call from Prime Minister Harper saying you're going to be appointed or was it, well, I, you I just wanted to be know, second sober, sec, second thought? No, no. I felt very, very strongly because 9-11 was a life-changing experience uh, for everybody. I mean, obviously Americans, but but to go into the into New York at that point when there was so much on the line is a lot of people won't remember because it was so long ago. But but the, the Americans basically wanted to shut down the border. CNN had reported that the terrorists had come from Canada, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I still talk to people today in 2022 who think that not the case uh, in this particular case, there have been others, but, but learning how profound that relationship really is. We all rattle off the statistics and we're each other's largest trading partner and more trade goes across the border in one hour than we do with, you know, Europe in one year and blah, blah, blah. It's all true. Um, but it, it was, it was, again, it was about, it was building the personal relationships with people and saying, look, I'm coming here because it's important. And then the Americans would stop and say, wow, we've got so many people that are fleeing our city and worried about our country and, and you're coming towards us and okay, so you're worth the time. And we really, honestly, I've never worked harder in my life at, at reconnecting, at explaining, because we had to explain to Americans too how much that trade, how important that trade is to them. It's yeah. that is genuinely a two-way street. And and when the Buy America policies came in, and, and then you would go and talk to a state governor and say, okay, you understand that if you do that, you won't have any uh, paper in your office, right? <laughs> it won't be there so like think about this for a little bit but just building keeping the 
the um, lines of communication open and educating, educating myself and them. Uh, so I felt so strongly about that. And Canadians tend to be really smug and, oh, our healthcare system is so much better and something like that would never happen here and blah, blah, blah. It's so when I came back here, it was that was really my focus. Then, as I say, I had that 10 months uh, going back and forth through Afghanistan and looking at that. Always been interested in defense matters. Um, daughter of a vet, you know, those kinds of things. So, and those two things really merged because in the wake of 9-11, there were decisions about Iraq and about Afghanistan and all of those things. So I really felt like my work w was just at a, at a beginning point there, you know, that, so I went on the foreign affairs committee and I was on the defense committee and ended up chairing the defense committee. And those things are important. And I now I chair the banking committee, which is really important because those relationships still matter. And we also happen to be in in a bit of an economic um, mess post COVID, but, but we were headed there anyway. So all these issues were important. And then I have other things that are quite personal, which I'm involved in the debate over made legislation, medical assistance in dying. My mother died of Alzheimer's, my father of cancer. These are people who would have used that option if they could have had it. So yes, you bring your experience to the table and your interest to the table, but you always have to remember that your first job is to review legislation and make it better. I, I want to talk about MADE for a few seconds, if you're okay with that, because mm -hmm. we yep. saw a report out of Vancouver earlier this week where a veteran yep. uh, accessed MADE, medically assisted in dying, and because he had PTSD. Um, he was there's, offered, yeah. yeah, he was offered. He, uh, yeah. There has been much political storm because of this report. Um, was this what it was meant for? What was made meant for? Because for transparency's sake, and everyone who's listened to the show knows this, I have recently been diagnosed with stage four cancer. Uh, I'm going through the process right now. We are dealing with a lot of things in this world right now. Yep. Um, but talk to me about where the Senate is on made because it came back to the Senate made to say, okay, we need, we need a revision of this because what the current legislation is on the books is not correct. So talk me through where the Senate is standing because you're on that committee. You're, you're, I am you're, on that committee. you're, you're a committee member. What's going on in that committee right now? I'll come to that immediately. Uh, first and foremost, my heart is with you. Um, uh, I Did have, I went through, uh, a cancer diagnosis myself just before I went to New York, it changes your view of the world. Um, and it certainly changed mine. And, and that's, I think where many of us come to this issue, which is, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be flip about this. I really mean this. We treat our pets and our animals better than we treat our loved ones and our elders. Um, we try and find peaceful, less painful departures for anybody um, in our own life. And I think that way back when, when you think about um, Sue Rodriguez and fighting for the right not to live through a hellish end, and that's where the discussion started and it's been up and down and up and down through the courts i think the supreme court did the right thing and say said here's the broad parameters now it's up to you as as lawmakers to figure this out and get it right um because it's not the job of the supreme court to legislate um and and the government this government this particular government and i and i'm not sure why because they're very young and progressive minded on so many issues and, and will give you the argument of pro-choice, um, you know, that we need in our life, but have been really putting some constraints around our right to choose how we leave this world. So I guess I came to it that way, which is watching both my parents in very different ways 
suffer watching my grandmother before them. And so I have kind of a particular thing, which is advanced directives, because by the time you are so sick that you need and want medical assistance in dying, you're often ruled out, you're considered not able to make that decision. So the government put in restrictions around the Supreme Court, like really narrowed what the court had said. And then we put proposed some amendments uh, to the bill and sent it back and government said, no, we're not going to do that. Then we started to have other provinces and courts in other provinces rule and started to expand. So one of the issues, well, two of the issues that we're dealing with at this committee now are the notion of an advanced directive that I should be able to say now, you know, if I am in the late stages of cancer or if uh, Alzheimer's, which I think is an inevitable diagnosis for me, given my family history, this is how I'd like to see it end. The other issue, which is I is granted, I, I grant is much more controversial, is that people with mental disabilities, PTSD, uh, longstanding mental illness should be able to access this. And I think that issue is the one that's triggered so many people in the community. We have heard from the disability community that this is, you know, that that what, you know, government wants to come after them and and all of those things. That is that is not the case. The people who are really, and I've got colleagues that are big proponents of this who've worked in the field all their life are just saying without cures and treatments whether it's cancer or a, a, a mental illness, you should be able to make that choice. It's not going to happen in all cases. And I think we see abuses of this, and we also see the issue used for political purposes. I mean, to, to make sure that a veteran understands all of their, or any individual understands all the options out there, I think is important. To present it if it hasn't been raised raises questions. Maybe the person has never thought of it. Um, but you, you know, that's something that the person should bring to the table. I just had a, a friend choose this last fall and uh, she was diagnosed with cancer and it was her fourth time through and, and she phoned me and I said, okay, what do you want to do? How do you want to approach this in terms of your care and all of this? And she said, I'm going to do that thing that you're on about in the Senate. <laughs> and I said, because we talked about it as friends, right? Yeah. And, and and I said, you mean made medical assistance in dying? And she said, yes. She said, I don't, I I I want a, a peaceful end. So it was really, um, particularly for those of us who were friends, and at least this is my perspective on it, a wonderful experience. She got to choose her time. She got to celebrate with her friends and family before she reached the point that she was no longer able to do that. And um, and she just she was she was always involved in the world of of drama. And so she was very dramatic. And, and when the doctor says, you know, are you sure the last minute, you know, are you sure you really want to do this and you want these people here? And she goes, yes, absolutely. And I'm going to kiss them goodbye and and she went out as as she had always lived so um i realize it's very difficult um for people to deal with but um you know we, we do we go and put our our dogs or our cats down if they're suffering and we ease their pain and and we we just need to have uh, a much more nuanced, honest, and real conversation about this issue, because it's really a tough one. It's tough for people um, of faith. It's, um, you know, it's tough for people who come from other cultures, and we're a very multicultural nation. And we just, we just really need to be honest with one another. And, and so we talk about it on Parliament Hill and all of that. And we have hearings and people come and go and there's black and white and left and right and you know all of that but this is a discussion about individuals and and having that conversation with your family 
and with the ones you love and with people who love you. And we just need to give people the tools to either make that choice or not make that choice. Nobody wants to force this on anybody. It's just, it's, it's just a tool that should be there for those who want it. I'm an avid uh, watcher of parliamentary uh, television. I, I, I watch yeah. the Senate hearings when they're on. I watch the House of Commons. I'm probably one of those rare. Oh, you poor thing. I know. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 te I tediously do that to myself every afternoon at one o'clock. <laughs> I make sure I tune in. You mentioned something there that I want to jump in on a little bit, if that's okay. And I know I said 45 minutes, but I'm enjoying this conversation. If you have 15 <laughs> minutes later, I, I, I do. If you, okay. Um, you, you talked about a conversation. You talked about the need to have this in, like absolutely necessary conversation. Um, I watched the House of Commons proceedings and sometimes it looks like like K through six, they're yelling at That's each other. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. And then I watched the Senate committees and they're actually having a conversation with each other. Yes, they're televised now, but they are civil. They are yeah. informative. Senators like yourself, I've watched you ask questions to the government uh, leader, the government representative in the Senate. I always forget the, the correct title yes. because there's no yes. liberal yes. senators. Um, but it's where actual things get done. Yeah. And I, I find that so fascinating that in 2022, with everything else that is so politically divided, the yeah. Senate has been sort of this echo chamber of civility in a such a toxic political environment why do you think that is do you think it's just because the senators know we're not here for dramatics we're not here to get elected yeah. like you said we're here yeah. just to be that second thought sober of uh, sober second thought I, I think fundamentally that's it I, I was talking to an american the other day um and explaining the difference and she said well your senate's not like our senate at all and i said no, you, I mean, it, they do have a process. It starts in the, in the House of Representatives and goes to the Senate, but, but you've got two elected bodies. And, and so they're always competing and it depends on who controls the body. Now there's politics in the Senate, there's no question. But, um, but, but we are not at that age and stage where you know we hope to get elected so that we can become prime minister or that we can become the most famous we most everybody in the senate has accomplished what they wanted to accomplish in their life and they've now found a way to continue to give back which is constructive but there's a reason you don't put 15 year olds in the senate i mean there's a minimum age 30 and you know out at 75 and you know our friends in in america might want to look at that they have term limits but they don't you know they don't deal with um some of these other issues so i do think that fundamentally that's the way it is we're also and this isn't you know there's younger people being appointed but i think we've all managed and survived and thrived in whatever our work world has been, whether it's media or NGO or who knows, business leaders or law firms. And we figured out a way to talk civilly with um, clients and customers and colleagues. And, and so it's more of our natural instinct to bring that to the work we do, which is, and, and it's just the old thing. I mean, if I, I may ask a, a hard question or a tough question or even an embarrassing question of someone, but I try to do it politely. You know, even if I say, look, this is your job to answer this question, but, and you haven't answered it the last three times I've asked you, but I'm going to ask you again. I'm still not saying, look, you're a, you're a horrible jerk that shouldn't have this job because it's way past your, you know, beyond your skill set. So why don't you step aside and let somebody else play? Do, would I expect to get an answer to that question? No. But if I respectfully say, I, I've asked you this and, and I really would like an answer on it, and it is your responsibility, then you got a better shot at it. Now, I want to talk about the politics of the Senate for a few minutes, mm -hmm. and then we'll wrap up here, uh, Senator. Um, you are part of, and I correct me if I'm wrong here. I think I've got the name of the the group correctly. The Canadian Senators Group. If I'm not, no. Yes, 
It's it could not be more bland. <laughs> okay. <than> true. <laughs> okay. So for my listeners who are tuning in, going, what does that mean? So. In the Senate, there are many groups and yeah. one political party that is represented in the Senate. The Conservatives yeah. still have a caucus, but there are also, there's the Independent Senators group, there's Independents, there's the former Liberals who sort of are call called themselves the Progressives. Yeah. Pro- progressives. So explain to my audience who are the Canadian Senators group, because we don't talk about the Senate that much, and I want to talk about them. We're the really sensible ones. I'll just. <laughs> <laughs> we are actually, um, and and when uh, when the prime minister said he was going to make the Senate independent, uh, nobody really knows what that means, especially when they're on the political side, because uh, there are lots of people, including many that sit in the House of Commons, that don't un- don't understand what the role of the Senate is. So they've changed a bit of the appointment process. You actually have to apply. And but, you know, the decision still lands on the the prime minister's desk, and that will happen regardless of who is in power going forward. But it did kind of create some shifts, because one thing that that uh, Justin Trudeau, he threw liberal senators out of his caucus, out of the liberal caucus and said, you're kind of on your own. If I'm going to make the Senate independent, then I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. So you're out. And then the and the conservatives are uh, still very traditional in their group and their response. The Senate is set up and constructed on a party basis. There is a leader of the opposition and there is a leader of the government. And you can call it the government's representative in the Senate if you want, but it's the same job. Um, And so people are figuring out how to struggle with this. So now there's a very small group that are the government's representatives in the the Senate. They're the ones that literally have to present legislation, uh, bring the government's legislation forward to us to debate. Um, Although they may ask others from other uh, groups to participate. So you've got the conservative group, you've got the progressive group, which are essentially the, the old liberals that although they've got some newer recruits. You've got the ISG, the Independent Senators Group, which are essentially people that were have been appointed under the new process and by the prime minister. And then there was a lot of frustration, I think, for those of us who have been around for a while and who just wanted to do our job and didn't want to reinvent the wheel. The job of the Senate is, and I've said it a hundred times today, is to review legislation. That's our fundamental job. Uh, yes, to represent the provinces um, that that you come from and that you were named for, to bring your issues forward. But your basic job every given day is to review legislation. So there were a group of us that were just kind of frustrated with all the party politics and the jogging, you know, jostling for position. And and we kind of had the conversations over coffee and a drink. And then eventually we said, well, why don't we just do it, right? So, um, and this has happened a couple of times, but a, a few people took the lead on this and I was asked if I would join them. And it's just a great group. We're, we're- Because you're not a party, right? You're, no, you're no, not we're a, not a party. Yeah. There's former liberals, there's former conservatives, there's former people who weren't ever involved in um, any anything at all. And so we get together to- because we all deal with a whole lot of legislation, which you can't possibly keep a handle on, right? You focus on what your committee's dealing with, what you're interested in. So we're there to educate each other, but not recruit each other to the cause. So I don't go to the meetings and say, I'm going to be talking about this. Please vote for me, right? Please support me. Please jump up. But but we educate and we we talk through things and we manage issues and say, what what is it like when when we were talking about the imposition of the emergencies act we had three at least three different vantage points represented by our members in speeches in the chamber you know um use the emergencies act never use the emergencies act you better have a darn good reason so we're going to give you another 24 hours to come up with it so you know it was at, but we talk a lot of those things through together so um i really like the group i i feel real freedom but i feel supported with a group of people who are interested in our fundamental job 
My last question for you is this, uh, Senator, and I know at the beginning I said I'd call you Pamela, but I still You're feel I, I still feel awkward saying uh, Pamela, <laughs> but I, I'll say it now. My last question for you, Pamela, is this. You <laughs> have had a distinguished career. We could probably continue talking for another two, three hours with you just about <laughs> your career, but also what goes on in the Senate. We, we always look forward in this, this, this show, mm. especially with people who are in your position of power um, or in office, I should say, not power because yeah. you're more in office. What do you want to accomplish? We are coming back into the fall session. Uh, you have a lot of things. The Senate is going to be accomplishing a lot, uh, tackling a lot of issues. Like you said, the Emergencies Act uh, leg- uh, committee is still going on. There's yeah. members of the Senate in there. What are you looking for to trying to accomplish in the remainder of 2022 and 2020 and, and into 2023? Well, I think more than ever, we need sane, rational, calm conversation. We're dealing with some very controversial bills, not just medical assistance and dying in that, but but bills that have to do fundamentally with the freedom of speech, um, B, uh, Bill C-11 and other related bills. And, and I think I feel very strongly about those things because of my background. You know, when I talk to my 20 year old nieces that have grown up on the phone, they don't have the same sense of protecting privacy and and the right to speak because they believe they have the right to speak uh, freely. But if, you know, if they find that what they're saying on these little machines that they carry around um, is stricken or that they're thrown off one of the platforms, they may have another view of that. So. I think this is a really larger conversation that's been totally politicized. It's, you know, like everything else in our world, everything's focused on Donald Trump, even though we live in a different country. Um, So we really have to, I think, wrestle some of those fundamental issues, right? Because it, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? Will, so will I, sorry, sorry, just a yeah. clarification note on for my my sake. Will the Transportation and Com- uh, Communications Committee, which you yeah. are a part of, be dealing with C11 or will that be another we, committee? We, no, we really are dealing with it already. It's you already are. Okay, up. that's what I thought, yeah. Uh, so in our committee hearings, we'll start very soon uh, back on that. And then the other assorted legislation. So um and as we watch what's happening uh, in Ukraine, we're going to have and must have a renewed focus on where we stand in terms of our commitments internationally. We we would be sending more to Ukraine if we had equipment to send to Ukraine, uh, but we don't. And uh, so these are big issues. We've got this fight that's going on over fertilizer and whether farmers are going to reduce their fertilizer, the emissions from fertilizer by 30% at a time when we're dealing with a food security crisis because of the war in Ukraine. Um, We need to balance climate concerns with uh, economic concerns, how our economy runs, what generates our economy, what is our responsibility responsibility internationally. So like we got a lot of stuff on our plate. Um, and to me, the job is for us to, to connect the dots to see how they are related. Because you can't talk about Ukraine unless you talk about defense spending, unless you talk about what our farmers grow and whether they will have the energy and the resources, literally the resources. Um, to make that all happen. So, you know, complicated discussions, but really important ones. And I can't, I can't wait to get back at it. My, I know I said the last question, but I have a follow <laughs> a follow up to that because you are the chair of the, I want to make sure I get this right, the Banking, Trade and Commerce Committee, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Now, there has been a lot of talk about cryptocurrency. And the only reason I say yeah. that is because I just did a live interview with a candidate in Saskatchewan who is running for a by-election there, and yeah. it, provincially, and cryptocurrency came up. Is the Banking, Commerce and, Banking Trade and Commerce Committee talking about cryptocurrency? Yeah. We, we did a lot of that in our session. And just as we were coming to an end in June of, uh, you know, not a study, but the end of our uh, hearings in June, the crypto market crashed. So um, that has a lot of people sort of panicked about, should we be talking about this 
you know, it's scary to people. People think it's some kind of crazy thing. It is sort of crazy, but the underlying technology and and the ability for, you know, blockchain and the ability to for people to conduct e-commerce and use alternate forms of exchanges. I mean, the world used to run on barter, right? <laughs> I would give you a cow and, you know, you would give me doctoring services and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, there's going to be new developments on this and crypto is one of them. So we'll certainly go back and continue looking at that because what we heard from many of the witnesses that we've heard from so far is that, you know, we need a structure. We need, this is going to exist. So either you regulate it or you just let it continue to be the Wild West. And the people that want parameters are the people that are in the industry. Uh, so already. So I think that, you know, um, it, it's it's not the magic, you know, we're not all going to be getting paid in um, crypto Bitcoin next week. Uh, but it is a real way that people uh, exchange payment for goods and services. And so we have to be realistic about it. No, and I appreciate you answering that 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 last question there. Well, yeah. but I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for taking time now to your busy your your kind of downtime sitting in yeah, the a little cab bit of downtime, yeah. and, and talking to me because I always enjoy these conversations and I always enjoy get letting people understand that our senders do things and there aren't just those old white men sitting in the upper chamber Smoking not cigars. doing. I don't I don't do cigars. Yeah, exactly. So no, it really is a different place, but I think it's. it's it's really important to understanding how our demo, how our system of government works and and what's at stake. It is. So I want to thank you, Pamela, <laughs> Senator <laughs> Pamela Wallen, for sitting down I, with me today. Thank I'm going to so have much. to call you Christopher now, not just Chris, <laughs> if you're going to do that. Exactly. No, and let me say, like, it, it's a real pleasure. Um, it's always, as you know, Oh, we didn't. We didn't even say. Make sure you tune into uh, Pamela Wallen's. Oh, no uh, nonsense. Pod- no nonsense with Pamela Wallen. No nonsense with Pamela Wallen. Yeah, it is an amazing that. interview <laughs> series as well. She has amazing guests. Rick Hillier. It is literally yeah. as the title says. No nonsense. nonsense. <laughs> That's exactly right. But it's it's great, as you know, and I know that these kinds of conversations where the people asking the questions are are smart and engaged really makes all the difference. I mean, we could both talk forever and I know it it's more of a one-way street, but I do want to say to you that and and I said it earlier, my heart is with you. This is a um a tough time, but you will my my how I dealt with this because we always talk about survivors and people who survive cancer and those things is that that you need to be an overcomer you need to overcome all these obstacles that have been thrown in front of you it's how you deal with it um not what the outcome is but how you get from point a to point b so i wish you strength and um and the love of uh, your family and friends around you because you're going to need it all well, thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you for sitting down with me. Yeah. Uh, to my listeners and to my viewers, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I will say this, and I say this at every end of every episode, get out from behind social media for at least 15 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy. It helps our society. And it helps us be a better people. We are off next week. All next week we are off, but we are back September 5th with another senator, a colleague of uh, Pam, uh, Senator Wallen's here, Pamela's here, uh, Senator from uh, Alberta, Karen Sorensen, will be sitting down oh. with us as well on September 5th. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. Yeah.